um, Soren asked me to tell you guys what's new in the area of wellness and biological health. And I'm very happy to have recruited my good friend Steve Cole, who's done some really pioneering work in this area. So we're going to tell you about two ways that DNA works, the modifiable part, modifiable part of our DNA, and how it's affected by stress and by mindfulness. And I'm and you'll very see happy that to these have recruited. two mechanisms are affected in the same way. So Steve's going to first tell you about this amazing inner machinery of the cell and how it works. Yeah, so there's two basic things our DNA does to keep us going uh, as human beings. The first thing it does uh, is it basically unwinds segments of our chromosome and opens them up to influence from the world outside us, basically as, as transformed into biochemical representations, hormones, neurotransmitters, that sort of thing. And so when it opens up, uh, that allows our DNA to essentially make contact with the outside world in the form of these transcription factors that bind onto the DNA and flag it for transcription into RNA. So as these RNA polymerases skate along the DNA and they copy off that uh, sort of illustrated yellow uh, sort of mirror image of the DNA at a particular genomic locus, that becomes the way essentially that our cells respond to the stream of life that we swim through. Uh, and the, essentially the fundamental miracle of human biology is the uh, sort of acquired programming of our 21,000 or so genes and the, the sort of two million years of trial and error that have shaped uh, our genome's considerations about which genes should be expressed in response to which kinds of circumstances, which challenges we confront, which opportunities come our way. So that's one of the central things that our genome does to keep us alive and thriving. The second one uh, basically involves its capacity to make copies of itself. This is fundamental to uh, the ability of our cells to proliferate, to, to make copies of themselves that then replace dead or dying cells, or grow up uh, new capacities in our body, grow new tissues. Uh, so that process of making copies of DNA is fundamentally dependent on these caps at the end of our chromosomes called telomeres. Telomeres basically are repetitive sequences of DNA that serve as sort of an insulator to protect the gene coding region of the DNA from damage or degradation. So you can sort of think of them as a, a protective coding. But as our chromosomes get copied uh, in the process of cell division, these telomeres shorten over time uh, because the enzyme that copies them doesn't quite make it all the way to the end of the existing DNA. So each time we copy our DNA, these telomeres get a little bit shorter. And after generations and generations of cell growth, you essentially uh, can erode these telomeres all the way down to the point where they don't exist anymore. And essentially, the cell uh, loses its license to proliferate from that, that point forward. So you can think of this as sort of a form of cellular aging. When the telomere grinds all the way down, uh, the cell doesn't die, but it goes into this sort of zombified state where uh, it remains alive, but it's not as generative or effective at carrying out physiologic processes. So for instance, just this last week, we learned that T cells from our, our white blood cells don't protect us against viral infections anywhere near as well if their telomeres are, are uh, corroded like this. So unlike uh, chronological aging, this kind of cellular aging, though, isn't a one-way street. It's actually possible to reverse this uh, dynamic, and that happens when one of the genes in our genome uh, gets activated to express the telomerase enzyme, and the telomerase enzyme basically goes into the telomere and adds back some of these uh, corroded portions of DNA. So essentially running uh, cellular aging in reverse, kind of like a molecular fountain of youth. So what factors regulate this dynamic cell aging system? Well, clearly development, aging, disease and illness, but also the narrative of our life. We've learned over the last 10 years that adversity, particularly severe adversity, is actually leaving a, a, a fingerprint or a mark on our genome. So uh, dealing with chronic difficult situations like caregiving and depression are related to telomere shortening. But even more profound, we know that the adversity effect has a much bigger impact in, in early in life, in early childhood. 
So we now know that children who are exposed to emotional neglect, abuse, violence, they have telomere shortening very early in life, and this lasts through adulthood. We see the imprint in adults who have undergone severe childhood adversity. So that's, so the telomeres are getting shorter and these zombie cells are getting more senescent and, and secreting inflammation. What about gene expression, that complex machinery that Steve talked about? This same diverse array of stressful experiences shapes the pattern of gene expression to be very stereotyped across different adverse experiences. And this response shifts cells toward overexpression of pro-inflammatory molecules and underexpression of all of the immune-boosting systems like genes that code for antibodies and antiviral mechanisms. So this consistent profile that Steve has discovered, uh, he labeled it the conserved transcriptional response to adversity, or CTRA, or you can just call it the stress gene response, like me. So this response and telomeres are creating a perfect storm of inflammation throughout our body in a chronic way. And inflammation we also call inflam aging because it, chronic exposure to inflammation is one of the most aging factors on our bodily tissues. So I've told you something that is probably um, very depressing, which is there is this memory in our DNA of our, of our difficult experiences. And then the big question becomes, can we reverse this? The signals that the cell listens to, the biochemical environment, is shaped by our mental state. So can we, through contemplative practice, which is probably holds the most promise for changing our, our daily experience and our, and our reactivity, can we reverse this mechanism so that the genome, despite its history of adversity, can blossom? So uh, over the last, I'd say, two to three years, there's been a, a nice spate of studies suggesting that, in fact, uh, extended periods of lifestyle change in general and um, particularly uh, intensive contemplative practice might, in fact, be able to reverse some of these dynamics. Uh, so a variety of different types of meditative practice have been studied in these different, um, ex essentially, experiments, randomized controlled trials of uh, lifestyle modification that then look at their effects on these genomic processes. And what they found is that uh, practices ranging from um, yogic meditation to mindfulness-based uh, meditation, um, cognitive behavioral meditation practices, and uh, uh, shamana meditation as well, all have been shown to modulate these adverse gene expression dynamics uh, in this uh, a more favorable direction. Uh, and also, uh, in a couple of cases, shown to increase activity of that telomerase enzyme that adds back shortened telomeres at the end. So these studies are important uh, to us as scientists because they're actually the first indication that there's a causal effect here. In other words, we're not just looking at correlations between adverse life circumstances and uh, these molecular characteristics, but this actually tells us that changing the way you think about the world for two to three months is sufficient to actually start to, to noticeably affect these kinds of molecular dynamics. And uh, one of the other advantages of these studies is as people's experiences change, that gives us a hint about what aspects of our experience of life are actually most instrumental or most influential in, in modulating these dynamics. And I think a couple of the studies have shown uh, somewhat consistently now that experiences of connection to the rest of humanity and our experience of meaning and purpose in life both seem to be recurrent themes that associate tightly with these more favorable molecular changes. Right. So that leads me to ask you, if I may, where your thoughts are and where they've been in the last five minutes. Have they strayed from the mindful genome? You don't have to, I'm not trying to out anyone. If I made you raise your hand, most of us would raise our hand that of course we've been mind wandering. This is the nature of the mind that we all have in common. But some of us more than others. So in a recent study, we measured this tendency toward mind wandering versus being very focused and engaged in the present. And what we found was that people who tend to spend much more time in negative mind wandering, thinking about negative things or wanting to be somewhere else, just having their thoughts not present, had the shortest telomeres. And conversely, people more engaged and focused 
in the present moment relative to mind wandering had the longest telomeres. And this was independent of our levels of daily stress. But affect still matters, and, and particularly happiness may matter. Yeah, so clearly adversity is not good for these molecular characteristics. Uh, but there's actually an interesting question about what is the best opposite of this sort of adversity? Is it the kind of hedonic well-being that comes from having lots of pleasant experiences in their own right? Or is it this sort of deeper, sometimes more painful, but argued to be ultimately more rewarding kind of eudaimonic well-being that comes from devoting yourself to a purpose uh, larger than your own happiness and self-interest? And a recent study done uh, by Barb Fredrickson's group with us uh, found that, in fact, it was the people that had relatively high levels of eudaimonic well-being that showed the lowest levels of expression of these adverse uh, gene expression profiles. And uh, interestingly, people who had comparatively high levels of hedonic well-being actually showed somewhat more adverse gene expression profiles. So that shouldn't be interpreted as saying that uh, being happy is bad for your molecular biology, so much as saying that the basis for your happiness and the extent to which it derives more predominantly from your connection to and contribution to the human experience broadly uh, and less from your own sort of um, consummatory or uh, sort of self-gratifying uh, bases actually is, is the, the more helpful version of this. So as you can see that looking at these genomic processes offers this whole new way for understanding health and disease, but also the fundamental role of mindfulness in our health. I'm never, I hope I never forget what John pointed out to us yesterday, which is when we look at our watch, it's now. And that's beautiful because that's cell time. Cells are always online, sensing the biochemical environment, which is shaped by our mental state. So now is always a great time for us to remember what matters, that we can become more connected to the present moment, remind ourselves to have more self-compassion and compassion for others, and to live these eudaimonic values out. And this may have reverberations all the way down to our genome. Thank you.